Hello, and welcome to One Spark Stories, the podcast where innovators, creators, and some unsuspecting risk takers share about navigating highs and lows, laughter and tears, and how sometimes all it takes is one spark of inspiration to find your way to happiness. This podcast will leave you inspired to take action on your own purpose as we connect, create, and celebrate unique sparks around the globe, once again proving that It is a small world after all. Dr. Jeffrey Barnes is a best-selling author and captivating keynote speaker that engages audiences with lessons learned from the one and only Walt Disney. In 2014, Jeff created a college course on the life and lessons of Walt Disney. The day after that first class, while still riding the high of it being a hit, He received unbelievable news about his health that truly could have stopped him in his tracks. Instead, he doubled down on his purpose, tackling that medical beast, and went on to write two best-selling books, The Wisdom of Walt, Leadership Lessons from the Happiest Place on Earth, and Beyond the Wisdom of Walt, Life Lessons from the Most Magical Place on Earth. Today, Jeff shares Walt's story with people in Anaheim, Orlando, and around the world through his speaking, workshops, unique online courses we'll talk about, and of course, through his own words of wisdom. Jeff continues to spread the positive message of Walt Disney to anyone that is looking to overcome adversity, go from a dreamer to a doer, and to be the hero in their own great story. As you will hear during our conversation today, he is so beautifully blends the history, nostalgia, and Disney experience that we've come to know and love with real life applications. If you've been looking for a way to fill your cup with a dose of that Disney magic, then you've definitely come to the right place. So I invite you to relax, pull up a chair, as the One Spark Stories podcast proudly presents Dr. Jeff Barnes. Hello, Jeff. How are you today? I'm doing well, Katie. How are you? I am fantastic. I am so glad that we have you on with us today because, my goodness, between your experience in education, the love for Disney, the way you've been able to put them together and make a beautiful career out of it, I feel like there are so many parallels that it's both exciting and very inspiring for me as I navigate this journey. So, Welcome. Tell us just well, a little bit you. quick synopsis of who you are, and what we can get excited for. Sure. So, well, thank you for having me on. Um, my name is Jeff Barnes and former now Dean of Student Success, Professor of Humanities. Uh, and I um, taught and still teach the world's only accredited college course on uh, the history of Disneyland, which I know for a lot of people sounds crazy. Uh, But for other people, they're thinking, wow, where was that class when I was in college? And uh, that course inspired not one, but two best-selling books, The Wisdom of Walt, Leadership Lessons uh, from the Happiest Place on Earth, and then a follow-up or sequel, Beyond the Wisdom of Walt, Life Lessons uh, from the Most Magical Place on Earth. And from there, a speaking career that has taken me around the country and around the world And I just recently retired from a two decade plus career in higher education. And now Katie, I get to follow my dreams and write and speak and teach that course online full time. It's amazing. And what I love is that even with your online course, I noticed that you're still allowing that opportunity for people that want to walk side by side through Disneyland to experience it. So you're not just dumping a course and saying, bye, you are there with people to show how much that, that experience matters. So is that something that you've had great feedback? Because personally, I think it's a genius model. <laughs> I, I, I am. Um, the, the park is a real passion for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't see uh, Disney as just an escape. I see it as an example. Mm-hmm. I don't see Disney as the place where dreams come true. I see it as the place that can show you how to make your own dreams come true. And so there's nothing that I love more than to take people to 
the original Magic Kingdom, the only Disney park that Walt Disney himself ever actually walked in. And so tomorrow morning, I'm giving a Disneyland tour. This Sunday, which just happens to be Disneyland's birthday, it opened on Sunday, July 17th, 1955. And this Sunday, July 17th, I'm giving another Disneyland tour. Uh, those are my favorite days, because even though I'm 58 years old, Walt once said, who says we have to grow up? And I've never quite grown up. I've never given up my love of Disney, not because I'm a kid who wants to go to an amu amusement park and ride a bunch of roller coasters. It's about Walt's story. It's the inspiration and motivation that I think we can all get when you realize he wasn't born successful, had more failures than successes. And even at age 53, when it came to his dream for a place where parents and children could have fun together, his own wife and his own brother did not believe in that dream. Walt Disney had to overcome every obstacle and every adversity imaginable, and yet he kept moving forward and made that dream a reality. And so if you know that story and you love Disneyland, you can leverage that love as inspiration and motivation for success and seeing your own dreams come true as well. And that's what I love. And quite frankly, that's what the course is about. That's what the wisdom of Walt is all about. Oh, I love that because I think to your point, it's not just a place that you go and experience and, and leave. There's a reason that my family has gone time and time again, that it is our, our place, but more so when I need to step away and process my own business, I, even if I go down with um, a group that is involved in business meetings, I'll go to the parks, but I will park myself on a bench. And it's weird. <laughs> it's like I'm channeling the inner wisdom of Walt right there, but it's, it's the stillness. It's being able to sit, to observe the emotions of people, you know, receive yeah. that energy. So it's just, it is a place of inspiration. And, and I, well, I have a lot of ideas and thoughts on where that has grown within your career, but I want to take it way back to the early years of Jeff, before you were known as Dr. Jeffrey Barnes or Dr. Disney, you know, whatever they want to call you. But when you were a kid, were you a very imaginative child? Was, was it something that you found as a natural tendency? I um I was always insatiably curious, mm -hmm. and if you had asked my friends, well, what is Jeff going to be? What is Jeff going to do when he grows up? They would have said history teacher, mm -hmm. uh, and from there, I love train sets. Uh, my mom visited Disneyland in 1960, just a few years before I was born, mm -hmm. and she had this puzzle from the park. And she shared it with me. She let me play with it. And so I would take that puzzle of Disneyland and then take my train set and put it around the perimeter of that puzzle, just like the railroad at Disneyland today runs around the park. People don't realize it. Um, but even before Walt dreamed of a place where parents and children could have fun together, he, he loved the railroad. And he started tinkering with trains. And so at the end of the day, Disneyland is a kid's giant train set. And so the railroad runs around the perimeter of the park. And it's as if everything in the middle is a kid's toy train set. It's, it's just phenomenal when you view it through that perspective. Uh, my first visit to a Disney park was at age 10 in 1974, Walt Disney World's Magic Kingdom. And the second I stepped onto Main Street USA, I knew, Katie, that if there was a heaven on this side of breathing, that had to be it. But oddly enough, my first visit to Disneyland, which did not happen until August of 1988, my first visit to Disneyland, I actually hated. I thought the park was too small. Uh, we got there at, at a you know, what I would now consider to be late, which is 11 o'clock on a Sunday morning, I wanted to ride Star Tours, which was the newest, latest, greatest attraction in 1988. 
went into Tomorrowland, learned I was in the right place for the attraction, wrong place for the line, which started way back at the beginning of Main Street USA. Took me more than three hours to experience my first Disneyland attraction. And by the time we were finished with Star Tours, the park was more crowded, was incredibly hot because it's the middle of August in Southern California. And by the end of that day, if you had told me I would end up doing what I'm doing now more than three decades later, I would have said you're absolutely crazy. But in terms of creativity, which is really the question that you've asked, I've always sort of seen the world a little differently. And I've always wanted to think outside the box. And, you know, when I was teaching courses, even basic U.S. history courses, you know, there would be a list of student outcomes. And the last one always was have fun. Because I knew if students weren't having fun, almost nothing else mattered. Because you learn more when you're interested. You learn more when you're what? When you're having fun. And so eventually we developed this course on the history of Disneyland. And there's a lot of reasons for, for why I did that. But the number one reason was it's the happiest classroom on earth, a great place to take students where, yes, they're going to have fun, but they're going to experience what Walt Disney himself called edutainment. And student after student after student, to include faculty members from the university who would audit the class, said to me, best course I ever took. And not because they got to go to Disneyland, but because it really was a cross-discipline course. They learned about engineering. They learned about history. They learned about business. Uh, they learned about art. They learned about theater. It, it really does combine all sorts of disciplines, just like Imagineering does. And they walked away realizing, wow, this wasn't just a class about an amusement park or even a class about U.S. history. This class involves everything because I believe not all roads lead to Rome, all roads, Katie, lead to Disneyland. That is so true. And yeah, there's, <laughs> what is it? There's a, a Main Street USA in every town. I mean, we've got it. So it's definitely not only the heart of the organization in that sense, but it's the heart of what I would say is your purpose, especially as you continue to move. And so that curiosity, especially with you being interested in history and seeing yourself as a history teacher, that all makes so much sense. With yeah, that, and so what, hap yeah, and what happened was when I hated Disneyland on that first visit, the curiosity in me got me wondering, well, how did I hate it? And everyone else in California mm -hmm. loves it so stinking much. And so I started reading up because I had to know, well, what did Jeff miss? And that's when I discovered Walt wasn't born successful. Again, had more failures than successes. And even after Mickey Mouse and Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs and everything else, wasn't able to just speak the words Magic Kingdom and have Disneyland magically appear out of an orange grove in Anaheim, California. It's been said when he was building Disneyland, Walt Disney did not have a friend in the world. That's how many people were out on his dream for an amusement park where parents and children could have fun together. But he did it anyway. And I just can't help but wonder how many people today have a great idea, a crazy thought, some sort of dream, and they're scared to get up off of their park bench. They're afraid to take action because everyone around them is out on the idea, and yet it could change their world. It could change our world. They just need to take action and move forward just like Walt Disney did in 1954 and 1955. Oh my goodness, words that many of us need to hear and be reminded of because it does, I think pursuing a dream, especially if you've been surrounded by the same people, the same community, suddenly you're changing and it, it will change the person that you people have perceived you as. And for a while it can get lonely when you start to realize, wait, not everybody is rallying around me. They don't, they don't, seem to want me to win well no they do they're just confused they it's unfamiliar when you were first moving into the idea of 
having this course become a thing, you know, shifting away that had to be a big conversation. And did you ever experience that at the higher ed level or within your own personal board of directors, board of advisors? Did you <laughs> notice that it got a little quiet when you mentioned doing a course on Disney and the wisdom of Walt? Well, I, I have experienced it on so many levels. First of all, um, the, the second I thought of it, I immediately doubted myself and wanted to step away from the idea, which I think all of us do at some level. Uh, yes. <laughs> you know, Walt, you know, it's, one of the quotes that's been attributed to Walt is all of our dreams can come true if we have the courage to pursue them. And I didn't want to pursue the idea of a college course on the history of Disneyland because I instantly knew it was, quote unquote, a Mickey Mouse idea. And I didn't want to go back to the university and be the faculty member who pitched this Mickey Mouse idea and, and, and lost his job and got thrown off of campus. And yet at the same time, and so I sat on it for a year, did nothing, which is what I think so many of us do. And then eventually it was something like the Hitchhiking Ghost in the Haunted Mansion you know, our ideas, our crazy thoughts, our dreams, they follow us home, they wake us up in the middle of the night. This was one of those ideas and dreams that simply would not let me go. And so finally, I, I went to my immediate supervisor, who was the chair of our history and government department, and pitched what I like to call my Mickey Mouse idea. And come to find out, he had been a cast member at Disneyland 30 years ago, and he didn't hate the idea. He actually loved it. And a lot of times, you know, we build up these monsters in our head when we sit on our ideas and we stew in the ideas. And so we overthink way too much. You can always overthink, but you can almost never overact. And oh, so... Yeah. Yeah, and so one of the main takeaways or souvenir stops that I want to leave with our listeners today is take action. Act, 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 act. You've thought long enough. Start taking action. And once I started taking action, the class came together, and, and, and then the next challenge was, and I think you know this is part of my story, I, I got to give the first lecture and the students absolutely loved it. And so the idea that you've got in your head, it matters, but it matters not just to you, it matters to others as well. Walt Disney built Disneyland because he wanted one, but we love it today, some 65 years later. And so your idea, your goals, your dreams, they count, they matter, but to others as well. So you need to get busy not just for your sake, but for the sake of others too. Students absolutely loved the class, but then after giving that first lecture, the very next day I was diagnosed with a life-threatening brain tumor. Uh, they wanted to operate immediately, told me I had the weekend to get my affairs in order. And then following the surgery, I was gonna be out of work for two months and I refused. And the doctor, the neurosurgeon at Cedar sinai in downtown Los Angeles had no idea why I would refuse to have life-threatening brain surgery. And I explained to him, well, I'm a, I'm a doctor too. I'm teaching a class and you're not touching me. And when I said to him, it was a course on the history of Disneyland. Oh, he was even more <laughs> confused. But again, this has become my passion, my purpose, and I, um, I, I refuse to give up on the students because the class isn't about going to an amusement park, getting on a roller coaster, and passing out easy A's. The course is about when you have a goal, when you want to be successful, when you want to see your dream come true, guess what? You're going to have to step up and you're going to have to overcome obstacles. You're going to have to deal with adversity. And now all of a sudden, I wasn't just going to lecture and teach on this. This was an opportunity for me to live this in front of my students throughout the course of the semester. I couldn't just walk away. And so that's what the semester looked like 
we delayed it for two and a half months and the course was successful. Fortunately, the surgery was successful. And then following the surgery, we then wrote the first of two best-selling books. And so if it weren't for the brain tumor, I don't know that the books ever happened. And that's one of the lessons. Walt most wanted to be remembered for all of his accomplishments. Most wanted to be remembered as a storyteller. But we forget great stories require conflict. Mm -hmm. And as much as we love stories, Katie, most of us don't want to deal with conflict. And so if you want to level up in your life and in your business, be willing to embrace conflict. Do hard and difficult things. And all of a sudden, your life and your business is going to start looking a lot better when you become willing to do the harder and more difficult things and challenges. Yeah. And, you know, not, not saying anything about that, having a brain tumor, because that is a hard and challenging thing I can't speak to, you can speak to, and in so many powerful ways, but it's amazing how, when we say do the hard things in reality, pulling back the veil on what we define as hard things, they're really not the hard things. It's the mental game that's the hard thing. Sure. Actually doing it. And, and I love the notion of 20 seconds of just insane bravery. In that 20 seconds, it can be life changing. And so, you know, going in and just laying that idea on the table is life changing. I love the way you are very clear about the fact that that first experience at Disneyland was not favorable. And you knew there had to be something more. So you use that guest perspective to really mold this pathway for yourself. And it's, it's a similar way that I used my cast perspective, starting my career as a cast member at the stores and then down at Walt Disney World and being embedded in such a defined organizational culture, then walking out and into other industries and leading, you know, in different companies. And suddenly it's like, whoa, wait a minute. It's kind of that same icky feeling where it's like, I now have a purpose and I feel this stirring in me to disrupt something and call it out, but I don't know what it is. And so leaning back into it and, and recognizing, man, there's a story to be told about Walt's failures and overcoming all of it. And who's going to tell it? If nobody does, well, I guess I will. And taking that in. And that's why, you know, I love what I've been able to connect with the podcast and the whole one spark of inspiration that came from my buddy Figment and the notion of connecting, creating, and celebrating in our unique purpose and our spark. And so, you know, I am grateful that we've become connected in a community which is really focused on that professional growth. It sounds like both the, um, you know, individuals at the university were supportive of your idea, but would you say- For the that, most part. For, okay, yeah, yeah. There's always going to be the because, ones that maybe not aren't. Because, you know, there were faculty members who audited the course. Mm -hmm. uh, there were, um, you know, people who went along on the tours. And then every now and again, I would- be in a meeting and somebody would give me a look, somebody would make a commentary. Um, the, the class got uh, press and publicity and that made people uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And then the books, I think the books were, were really interesting. I had to meet with legal counsel that made um, folks mm -hmm. really uncomfortable. And then I was told after they did really, really, really well, well, yeah, in, 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 in university setting, you're supposed to publish, but you're not supposed to publish anything that actually sells. <laughs> so it was as if I had, you know, sold out by writing something that was popular. Mm -hmm. And it's one of those things where, you know, I, I, I just didn't care. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Walt, um, Walt never made a movie that was for the critics. He made movies that people enjoyed. And I wanted to teach a course that connected uh, with the kids, if you will, meaning the students. And I wanted to write books that told Walt's story and the stories that are told in the parks that most importantly 
connect with the readers, their story, and whatever it is that they're trying to accomplish. And it wasn't written for an academic audience and the four people at an academic conference that may or may not care and may or may not read it. And again, know your audience and figure out how you want to connect with them. And at the end of the day, persuade them and, 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 and move them. And so, uh, you know, you're, you're never going to convince everyone. And if your idea um, is supported by everyone, chances are you don't really have that good of an idea. Yeah, it's not different enough. It's too familiar and comfortable for people. Correct. Yeah, that's really a powerful perspective. Do you think that the amount of yays to the to the knowledge you were providing and the insight or the amount of nays from those doubters or those that were maybe um, a little discontent with the success you were having with the books, were those, either of those maybe what helped spark that notion that it was time for a career change, that maybe it was time to hang up your hat in higher ed? What was it that, you know, said, Jeff, it's time to maybe end this chapter and make that shift forward? Oh, that's a great question. Um, there were really two main factors. Um, one was, as we started to come out of the pandemic, my uh, speaking schedule um, in, the, in the fall of 2021 was mm -hmm. just impossibly crazy. Mm -hmm. uh, I, uh, you know, found myself flying all across the country trying to keep up my full-time administration job and my professor job. And I was signing, you know, books at one o'clock in the morning, three o'clock in the morning, grading on airplanes, relying on my team in the Office of Student Success and knowing that, you know, it wasn't fair to them. It wasn't fair to the university. Um, I was keeping up with my students and my, and my classes fine, but the admin portion of my job uh, you know, that that I wasn't um, really giving a fair shake and, and quite frankly, wasn't really enjoying um, anymore. And then secondly, uh, you know, Walt always said, you know, he didn't want to do sequels. He, he hated repeating himself. Well, in terms of unfortunate sequels, I had a second brain tumor in 2020. And people had said to me repeatedly, you know, you talk about going all in on your goals and your dreams, like Walt did following the bankruptcy with Lappergram Studio in Kansas City in 1923. And that's what forced him to come to California, boarding a train with $40, a single suitcase and a one-way ticket. When are you, Jeff, going to follow your own advice, listen to your keynote and do the same with the wisdom of Walt? And following the second brain tumor, I realized if I'm ever going to take a shot at doing this full time, now was the time. And so between the crazy schedule in fall of 2021 and coming out of the second health scare, I, I just said, you know what, we're, we're, we're going to do it. We're going to go for this thing. And whatever happens, happens. And it's interesting because when I made that announcement on social media, the number one question was, that's great, congratulations, what's gonna to happen to your history of Disneyland class? And that's what prompted uh, the move to online and it sold out within 24 hours. Just fantastic. And Peep, that is, is it still available for those that are interested to- So we're, we, are, we are right now launching a second section uh, which is going to go live this week, but we still have slots available. Uh, so um, people, I'll, I'll send you a link to that, Katie, awesome. and people can, um, yeah. you know, find out about that. But there's uh, there's several tiers. Uh, you can take all of it at your own pace. Uh, you can take it at your own pace, but then connect with me for an hour a week. And then the third tier is take it at your own pace, connect with me for an hour a week, but then at the end, uh, you have the opportunity to take a tour of Disneyland, happiest place on earth with me. And that level includes your park ticket, Genie Plus, parking, and lunch, which I think is a phenomenal exp experience and tremendous value. 
Yeah, I was looking at over um, just the other day, actually, and I was like, oh my gosh, to to be able to experience it. And I'm kind of a park tour nerd. I've done a bunch of them out down at World. I did the Walk and Waltz Footsteps tour and walking. I mean, it truly is a full sensory experience. The sights, the smells, the, the everything. And so being able to not just get this content and the information, but to experience it, that again, I think that is such a differentiator. And when people talk about think differently, there are so many courses out there. What sets yours apart in that thinking differently is that you're still available and even more so in an intimate and aligned way than most that say, well, I could have a one-on-one -on -one call with you sometime. Um, right. You know, it, it's just, it, it's an incredible value add. So I think it's a really cool way to create and enhance content that means something to you. And, and just so you know, um, the tour is very attraction centric. And because of my experience, the first time going to Disneyland, my goal is to get uh, people on the attractions in a short amount of time as possible. So uh, I've, I've mastered it. I've got it down to not just an art, but a science. And so we do about 15 attractions by two o'clock in the afternoon with virtually no waiting because I don't want to experience the three hour Star Tours line ever again. <laughs> right. No, that has been your purpose since that day is to not Correct. let this become a thing. And it, so I, I wonder then, Jeff, when you go to the parks, not just your favorite, let's approach it this way. If there were an attraction at any of the de Disney destinations that you would say, this one personifies Jeff Barnes, which attraction would you say? is, is it, the one. It's, it's Space Mountain. Yeah. I love um, that. And, you know, my, uh, you know, following the two surgeries, I was restricted, severely restricted from a lot of the park's attractions for mm -hmm. 24 months, both times. And when those restrictions were lifted, the first attraction that I raced to both times was Space Mountain, because that is the one that I missed the most. Now, having said that, um, it, it, it's not that I think Space Mountain is Disney's best attraction, but it's my personal favorite. When I'm on Space Mountain at Disneyland, not necessarily at Magic Kingdom at Walt Disney World, but at Disneyland, that's where I know that I am quote unquote home. And there's something about being in the dark, the cool of the air um, while you're, you know, racing around indoors. And I think there's something about it being in the dark because that's sort of how life is. I tell people all the time, if you want to embark on this journey of entrepreneurship and becoming an author and a speaker, and if you need one plus two to equal three and A plus B to equal C, you're headed down the wrong road. This is a journey on Space Mountain and you don't know where the next turn is headed. You, you, you're going to be asked to do things and trust that it leads somewhere and it might and it might not. And you need to be OK with that. And, you know, my life has taken a lot of twists, a lot of turns, a lot of dips, but we continue to have fun with it regardless. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So even though you say Space Mountain, I'm like, man, it's like Big Thunder. It's kind of like Splash. You got a happy place too, right? It's a little bit of all the mountains. <laughs> yeah. there's, a, there's a dose of magic, but I, I think that's so true, especially as an entrepreneur going into the dark, there is an element of unknown, but you have to trust that journey. You have to. Yes. And so you've been able to leverage this you know, community and connection mm -hmm. to not only your purpose, but people that have empowered you to drive it. You've created incredible things. And I want to make sure we tap into that third pillar of One Spark, which is really about celebrating. And things that we don't do enough is celebrate ourselves. You know, it's all being self-aware and being proud of others. But I think aside from celebrating the success of the brain tumor, two brain tumors and could have really derailed, but instead um, really helped you thrive in this purpose. What is something we maybe haven't talked about or addressed with you that 
you're like, you know what? I do want to celebrate this that people should be more aware of. I, I think the idea that you can go back to your childhood and reflect on something that you did as a kid, that you loved as a kid, and reach back on that and find yourself all over again as an adult. Um, like I said, I loved toy train sets when I was a kid. I loved Walt Disney World the first time I walked into it at age 10. And now here I am at age 58 and experiencing that at a different level and yet very much in a same sort of way almost every single day. And I think we need to celebrate what it is that we truly love and make ourselves okay with that. Mm. Uh, you know, I was thinking over the weekend, I went to go see the Marvel movie Thor, um, Love and Thunder, which I didn't think was a great movie, to be honest with you. Um, but having said that, it reminded me of, you know, the whole Thor and the hammer and are you worthy? And at the end of the day, I think all of us are worthy, Katie. You know, we're worthy of our ideas. We're worthy of our crazy thoughts. We're worthy of our dreams. They're worthy enough for us to take action. And whatever it is you're passionate about, whatever it is that you loved as a kid, lean into that and trust it and, and, and go with it, even if it's just for five minutes a day. Let, let five minutes become 10 minutes. Let 10 minutes become 20 minutes and build on that over time and see how it can transform your current life, which you might not like, you might not love, but see where it can take you over time. And I, I know for me, you know, people are like, um, you know, how many times are you going to go to Disneyland? When, when, when are you going to grow out of this? And the answer is always and never. And I'm pretty darn good with that at this point. Yeah. Yep. I think that we're never too old. We're never too young. It's, it's a place that, again, makes those experiences come to life. I had to chuckle early on when you mentioned that first time walking in and thinking, wow, it's heaven out on earth. When my grandma passed, she was my Disney partner in crime. And just the, even though it was much later in her life that she got to experience it, it became her happy place. And so, gosh, we might be a sick, twisted family, but I also grew up in a funeral family. So when my dad was funeral director, and so it just felt like shifting to the celebration of life. And at the end of her funeral, at the end of, um, you know, the viewing, we closed out with this song, Magic Kingdom in the Sky, and it's a campy little doo-wop song, and it talks about how, you know, we're moving on into that Magic Kingdom, and it references all the pop culture silliness, but I think the more we can embrace the fun and the reality of all of us are who we were, all of us have that childlike wonder in us. It's just sifting through all the things we've been taught, trained, and told, and unlearning that in order to unleash that potential and that purpose. Like you said, it, it doesn't go far from where we ever were. And leaning into that is where really your purpose will come to life. So yeah. I love that reflection. Yeah, yeah. real, real quick. Um, you know, Walt had a difficult childhood, difficult relationship with his father. The only good memories from his childhood were the years in Marceline, age four to nine, and it were the good. It was the good memories in contrast to the difficult childhood mm -hmm. that he wanted to recreate when he built Main Street USA, the single entrance in and single exit out of Disneyland. And it's as if he allowed himself to be vulnerable, i.e., lean into the wound of his childhood when he built the park. And there's a lot of talk today about the importance of vulnerability, but there's not a lot of talk about what the word actually means. Well, to be vulnerable means to lean into the wound. And when Walt built Main Street USA, he built, he leaned into the wound of his childhood and tapped in to the one or two 
good memories that he actually had. And as a result, gave all of us a great memory every time we walk in and every time we exit out. And I know there, there's a lot of talk about childhood traumas and the way it sets us up for failure in relationships and you know difficulties in life. And I have no doubt that there's a lot of truth behind all of that. But my challenge to you and to the listeners is, why don't we also lean into what we liked and loved about our childhood, see what we can redeem from that, and find some fun and some love and some passion as well. I love that challenge. Accepted. Challenge accepted. Take it. <laughs> put a happy little bow on it. No, I know what I need. I'm going to grab something that just feels even more fitting to close out such an impactful piece because these are my special happy ears from the 50th celebration of the, um, let me be very clear. I received these ears at the most magical place on earth in celebration of Disneyland's 50th back in 2005. So I love nice. that you differentiate in your books even between the two um, because Correct. not everywhere is the most magical place on earth. It's very, very unique fun. Yep. But yep. Jeff, it has been an absolute pleasure. I know that um, I've gained a lot. I can only imagine others will. So make sure I will make sure to connect them with information about the course. And then where else can people connect with you? So you can find me at the wisdomawalt.com. Again, we're teaching the class online. I'm available for keynotes, uh, workshops. I travel the country, travel the world, trying to help um, companies, corporations, uh, conferences, uh, association gatherings. Uh, and then you can find my books on Amazon. Again, The Wisdom of Walt, Leadership Lessons from the Happiest Place on Earth, Beyond the Wisdom of Walt, Life Lessons from the Most Magical Place on Earth. And the books are available, um, hardcover, softcover, Kindle, Audible, uh, pretty much any format you can imagine. That's perfect. And if they're not connecting with you on any of these, what dining or snack line could they connect with you in at Disneyland? Where is your favorite place to go grab something? As a foodie, there's got to be somewhere. For well, myself, believe it or not, I am known more on social media for my love of ice cream Ooh. than I am for even Disney. So if you're in line for a Mickey bar at Disneyland or even Walt Disney World, chances are I'm in line with you. And the Mickey bars are better at Walt Disney World than they are at Disneyland because they don't keep them in dry ice in Florida and you have the humidity which causes them to melt a little faster and so the texture is better. I did an event for Nestle and I talked with them about this fact and they're like, yes, you're not wrong. Um, they, they are better at Walt Disney World than they are at, 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 at Disneyland. Uh, in terms of restaurants, I think the Blue Bayou, mm -hmm. which is uh, next to Pirates of the Caribbean at Disneyland, if you've only ever ridden Pirates at Walt Disney World's Magic Kingdom, I would argue you haven't really ridden Pirates. And of course, we have the great Blue Bayou restaurant uh, next to that attraction. In terms of just counter service, uh, in Adventureland at Disneyland, I am a huge fan of Bingo Barbecue and the beef skewers. See, you just made my stomach growl. And remembering the <laughs> bio, the big perk there also being just being able to visualize Walt walking the track of pirates. And then yeah. from there, the excellent viewing for Fantasmic at Disneyland. So, so many perks to that dining spot, but oh gosh, I just feel like we could go on and on about the happiest places. <laughs> So Absolutely. fantastic. Jeff, thank you so much. I look forward to others getting to hear from you and connect with you to continue to share the wisdom of old. Well, thank you, Katie. And thank you to your listeners and to everyone. Never stop dreaming. There it is. In a world of bland, template-based, set it and forget it online courses, please be a Jeff Create something that you believe in so much that you can only hope people take you up on the opportunity to come and walk alongside you. 
When Jeff's course was first launched and I saw that he had the option of adding on a day exploring Disneyland with him, my first thought was, oh man, I would love to do this. But then in addition to the course and that add-on, I have to get a park ticket, make a reservation, et cetera, et cetera. It blew my mind that his course, The History of Disneyland, included that value add option with all of that covered. And as you heard, he is going to make sure to maximize that time at the park. So if you're ready to see what experiential learning is truly like, then break in those walking shoes, grab your finest set of ears, or save for a new pair, and get ready to learn the wisdom of Walt from the man himself known as Dr. Disneyland. Thank you so much, Jeff, for igniting a spark in me as a reminder to keep moving forward with my own purpose. Truthfully, it can be lonely at times. People don't always understand and they do disappear. Sometimes it can definitely be an up and down Space Mountain-like attraction, but when it is rooted in the very things that you or I know and love, then anything is possible. As Walt Disney himself said, all the adversity I've had in my life, all my troubles and obstacles have strengthened me. Until next time, be well, stay curious, and we'll see you real soon. Did you know Space Mountain is one of the slowest thrill rides in Magic Kingdom? Clocking in at only 28 miles per hour. Later, Tater.